Well, this morning, if you want to turn with me, if you want to follow along, you're going to be turning a lot of scriptures. I'm going to bring up a lot of good points and a lot of good uh, uh, kind of tour through the scriptures. But to start off, and we're going to end in the same spot, so make sure when you turn away from there, keep your place in 1 John chapter 4. This morning, I want to talk about filling the hole. Well, let's start off, like I said, in 1 John chapter 4, and I'm going to read verse 8. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. So I want to start off today, this morning, I want you to think about love. I want you to think, what, what do we usually use to symbolize love? You know, anytime we think about love, we want to send a valentine to someone we love or a card that, that exudes love. We usually use a, a heart. So this morning I want you to, to picture a heart. If you have to, close your eyes so to get this mental image in your head. I want you to keep that image in your mind. That when we think of this heart, we think of something, something beautiful. Something bright, something red, something vibrant, something alive. Now, keep that in your mind as we now look to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 27 and verse 31. Genesis 1, 27 says this, So God created man. Now, our first verse said God is love. So you can say, love created man. So God, love, created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, Created he them. Now here we see the creation. Now if we jump down to verse 31, it says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning was, were the sixth day. Do you see what God said here about his creation after he was done? He said, It was very good. So when we read that scripture that says, God said it was very good, then we ask ourselves, what is very good to you? What is very good? You know, someone will watch a movie and, and they'll say, it was very good. Others aren't going to like that same movie. Same thing with the song. There may be a song that plays on the radio and you may go, that's a very good song. And you might be sent out to your buddy and you say, well, I don't really like it. So what is very good to you? You know, you may get an 89 on a very hard test and think, that is very good. But you take it home and your mom and dad might not think that's quite so good. They might say, well, why not just one more point and get that A? Or they might even say, why even miss anything at all? Why didn't you study hard enough to make 100 on that test? But to God, when God says it was very good, that means perfection. God doesn't have some fluctuating standard of good. If it's very good to God, it's perfect. There's no flaws, there's no blemish, there's no sickness, there's no scar, there's no stain, there's no sin in creation when God created it and said it was very good. So when God says it very good to God, that means it's fully whole. So again, think about this. I want you again to keep that picture of heart in your mind. And think about the love that comes out of that. You see, God manifested his love toward creation with a gift. He gave them the gift of the garden. But he gave them that gift, and along with it, he gave them one simple rule. If you, if you did go into Genesis, you can go down to Gen chapter 2 of Genesis, where we see the rule that came along with the garden. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, tells us... <coughs> And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. You see, God gave man a beautiful, <coughs> fruitful place to live. This was a, a place that was flowing with and flowing from the love of God. But we have to understand there was a problem. Man broke 
the one rule. The one rule for which God said, thou shalt surely die. We have to understand what death means in a biblical standpoint. Death equals separation. <coughs> you see, when a loved one dies, we don't mourn where they've gone off to. We are saddened because of the separation that there has happened. We don't get to see them anymore. We don't get to talk to them anymore. We don't get to touch them anymore. And depending on how close we were with this, this person, sometimes it really just it, it breaks our hearts because of the separation that exists there. Now you see, Adam and Eve didn't physically die that day that they ate that fruit, but there was an immediate separation that occurred when they ate that fruit. There was an immediate separation from God. And if God is love, then there was an immediate separation from love. There was a death of innocence, a death of fellowship. Sin entered into the world that day, and it punched a huge gaping hole in the heart of man. Keep in mind that picture of the heart, and now imagine a big gaping hole in the center of it. You know, there's a song on the radio, if you like to listen to the Christian, uh, contemporary Christian songs, that talks about there's a God-shaped hole in all of us. And that is that hole that was punched there in the heart of man by sin. And since that very day, since the day that in that garden when they ate of that fruit and that hole was punched in there, man has tried to fill that hole in many different ways. And that's what we're talking about this morning. Filling that hole. So you may ask, well, what are the different ways that man has tried to fill that hole? Well, one way is money. Sometimes man will try to fill that hole with money. The Bible is full of stories of people trying to gain more and more wealth. Many of us are very familiar with the story of Jacob and how he had worked for his uncle Laban to, you know, to earn his wives. Chapter 31 of Genesis tells us that Uncle Laban had changed the deal he had with Jacob, or changed his wages, changed the deal he had with Jacob ten different times. There's too many people out there that attain great wealth, and they're just not satisfied with what they've attained. They're trying to fill the hole with money. They're trying to fill this hole, and that hole just keeps getting bigger the more money they throw at it. They are just never satisfied. The book of Luke, chapter 12, has something to say about the matter. A parable given to us by Jesus Christ. Luke, chapter 12, verses 16 through 21, tells us this. It says, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my food. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, So thou hast found, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You see, the rich man wasn't satisfied with what he already had. So he wasted away his life gaining more wealth. He didn't use the time that he had to get to know the Lord. It said here, this is a person who's not rich towards God. He didn't use the time that was given to him to get to know the Lord. Matthew 6, 19 says, Lay not up yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. You see, money, money is a fleeting thing. You can be a millionaire today and a pauper in the poorhouse tomorrow. Too many things out there can cause the loss of our wealth. Just talk to anybody who went through, uh, who, who, had to delay their retirement because of what happened on 9-11-2001. A lot of people saw their nest eggs, they put back, plummet to almost nothing. Wealth is a fleeting thing. If your happiness depends on wealth, then you're headed for a life of sorrow. 
1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You see, pursuing money distracts us from pursuing God. It distracts us from pursuing the love of God. It distracts us from truly feeling the whole. And money's not the only thing. What about relationships? Some try to fill that hole with the love of some other person. We may seek it in the love of a parent. We may seek it in the love of a boyfriend or girlfriend. We may seek it so hard that we may make bad decisions with our relationships. Just, you don't have to look very far in the Bible to find someone who, who fell under that category. Solomon, the wisest man apart from Jesus to ever walk the earth, he made bad relationship decisions. Those bad decisions are documented in 1 Kings 11, 1 through 3. It says, But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. And he had 700 wives, princes, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. Now you may not be looking to have 1,000 relationships, but you can still be looking to a relationship to fill the hole. Solomon had loved 1,000 different women all at the same time. And when you think about that, do you think that this filled his hole? Do you think that this really made him happy? You see, Solomon examines his life, and he has this to say about it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, beginning of the chapter, in verse 1, this is what Solomon had to say about it after he examined his life. He said, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he hath taken under the sun? You see, Solomon, he took a look at his life. And as he examined what he had done with his life, he said, there's nothing worthwhile that I've done. I had a thousand different relationships and none of it was worthwhile. Ecclesiastes 7.28 even says, One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. What is he saying there? He's saying that he could not find true happiness in any single one of those 1,000 women. When you are depending on a, a relationship to fill the hole, then you're going to be facing heartache. You're not only Solomon. He's not the only case in the Bible that chose poor relationships, had bad decisions. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the story of Samson and Delilah. Judges 14, 1 through 3 tells this story. It says, And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. And he came up and told his father and his mother and said, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said unto him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said unto his father, Get her for me, for she pleaseth me well. She pleased him well. I don't have to tell you what she ended up doing and the pain she ended up causing, but you see, Samson sought joy in places other than the Lord. It's maybe beyond the time of some of you younger folks, but anyone who's my age or older remembers the song, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. That's what Samson was doing. <coughs> now you may ask, are you saying there's no such thing as true love? No, I'm not saying that. I truly do believe in true love. I believe that true love is the greatest love of all. I believe you will find that love in Jesus Christ. You see, because God is love. John 15, 13 tells us, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You see, the love 
that Christ showed towards us, that is true love. The problem with our society is that we equate true love with romance. We equate true love with warm, tingly feelings that we have all inside of ourselves. And to be honest with you, that's just infatuation. That's not true love. Now, I'm not saying that you can't find love in marriage either. No, I deeply and I truly love my wife, and I know that she loves me. There's a very fulfilling relationship there. The problem is when we try and let that love, or the search for that love, take the place of God. There needs to be love in a marriage relationship, but it needs to take the proper place behind the love of Christ. Matthew 6, 33 says this, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, I ask you this. Why is it that we, even in churches all through America, why is it that we believe that, except when it comes to whom we are to date and whom we are to marry? We, we want to change that. We want to say, Seek ye first the romantic relationship. Seek ye first romantic attraction. Seek ye first a compatible match. But that's not what this says. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. I truly believe that if we are seeking the will of God, and we make that our priority, and then we find somebody else who's doing the same thing, and we that, out of that we create a marriage union, then the goal of that marriage union will always be to glorify God. That's God's plan. So there's money, there's relationships, but some try and fill the hole, even with things that seem good. All these things have a proper place. Some try and fill the hole with religion and church. Now I want to tell you this right now. There is a difference between filling the hole with God and filling the hole with His love. There's a difference between that and filling it with church and religion. Let's, case in point, let's look at Mark chapter 7, verses 3 through 8. In Mark chapter 7, verses 3 through 8, it says, For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups and pots, brass and vessels, and tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the traditions of of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands. He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. As it is written, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, behold, tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. Remember what he said there. He said, This people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How many people out there today seek out ceremonial over spiritual? How many people in pews across America today are simply just going through the motions? How many have heeded false teaching <coughs> drifted towards works to save them? 2 Timothy 3, 5 says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. You see, those that are simply going through the motions, those that are simply just putting on a show, work to avoid those things. Sometimes people can get far too caught up in just their attendance or their duties at church and forget the real reason why they are there. Church cannot be a show. Church cannot take the place of an actual relationship with Jesus Christ. Another thing that people try and fill the hole with, attention and pride. We see a story in the book of Acts, chapter 12, verses 21 and 23. It says, And upon a set day Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and he gave up the ghost. You see, Herod sought only the attention and the accolade of others. 
He let his happiness depend on the praise of other people. And he became so caught up in it that he let people equate him to a god. And you have to understand that the Lord would not and he cannot tolerate that extreme. It's true that we, we all enjoy being praised for our accomplishments. All of us enjoy that. You know, it's, it's very nice after delivering a message to have people come up and shake my hand and say, that was a good message. It feels good. But I would be absolutely remiss if I didn't give God the glory for that message. I'm just a messenger. It's God's message. It's not mine. And even though we like praise, we always need to keep our pride in check. We need to make sure that we don't allow our pride or, or the attention of others to replace the Lord in trying to fill our hope. Proverbs 26, 12 says, Seest thou a man wise in his own conceit? There is more hope of a fool than of him. You see, Solomon says, there is no hope in pride. You will not find hope there. The problem is that the, the proud are too focused on self to even see their need for God. They're too busy filling their hole with trophies and praises and adoration of others to see that it can never fully fill them up. You know, fame, just like money, isn't going to last. The popular artists today could fall down tomorrow. The A-list actors of today are going to be replaced tomorrow. Fame is a very fickle thing. So don't try and fill your hole with something so temporary, because seeking fame keeps one from seeking God. Psalms 10, 4 says, The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all of his thoughts. When you're stuck about thinking about yourself, you're not thinking about God. Now, one of the most widely used methods to fill the hole today is entertainment. I've heard many people say, if you want to see where people's priorities are, see where their money goes. Just look around and see how much money is spent in America on entertainment. We have satellite TV, we have video games, we have movies, we have professional sporting events, we have Disney World. You name it, it's out there. All vying for a piece of your money. We spend a lot of our time looking for ways to be entertained. We move from one entertainment to another just seeking to feel good. That's, that's what it's all about, about filling our hole, is we want to feel good. And I haven't even mentioned yet how much money is spent and how much energy and time and brain cells are wasted on drugs and alcohol in our society. We want to feel good, so we seek out something to give us that feeling. Back in Ecclesiastes again, Solomon, uh, looking over his life, he says this in chapter 2, uh, starting with 1 and 3. He said, I said in my heart, go to now, I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is man and of mirth. What doeth it? I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was that good for the sons of man, which they should do under the heaven all the days of their life. So moving on down to verse 10, it says, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. Then I looked on all the works my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do, and behold, all was vanity and a vexation of spirit. And there was no profit under the sun. You see, Solomon, he looks back after a lifetime of, of pleasure and entertainment, and he said it. It was nothing. It was all vanity. It was a vexation of his spirit. None of these things can fill the hole punched in the heart of man by sin. Only God can fill that hole. Christ said it this way. In Matthew 5, 6, he said, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. You shall be filled if you seek the Lord in his righteousness. Did you hear what Christ said there? He says, You will be filled. You can have the most fulfilling life ever imaginable if you put Christ at the center. 
Let Him be your focus. Let Him fill that hole. John 10, 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. More abundant life. Do you want more abundant life? Do you want to fill whole again? Christ has come to give us just that very thing. Christ wants to fill you up. I told you to keep your place in 1 John, and I told you we closed there, so now we've come full circle. Here we are, back around where we started from. 1 John chapter 4, the very next verse. We started in verse 8. Let's end it in verse 9. 1 John chapter 4, and verse 9 says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because the God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. You see, through Christ, we not only have eternal life, but we have a fulfilled earthly life. Let God fill the whole. Let Jesus Christ fill you up. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's no way He can fill that hole. You first have to have a relationship with Him to build upon Him. So I ask you today, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your faith and trust in Him this morning. Know that He died on the cross for your sins. And know that only through faith and trust in that very thing can you have eternal life and can you have a fulfilled life here on earth. So say yes to Jesus Christ. Let Him fill the hole in your heart. As we stand, as we have the musician in the song that will come, I have a verse of invitation.